All right, welcome back to an edition of Benton Fry Fishing. Obviously, this is a very unique format. Um, I'm not sitting on the water somewhere. I'm sitting in my office and you're staring at a presentation. Uh, so this is my take on how to catch alligator gar. This is going to be the long version of the video. I'm going to break down each individual part into smaller videos. If you want to just watch the smaller videos on location, uh, the setup I use and how to handle these fish, go ahead and find those videos in the collection that's in this folder on my YouTube channel. Otherwise, this is the long complete guide that breaks down every individual part. Uh, there's a few videos on YouTube right now on how to catch alligator gar. Um, there's one guy who's been making videos on these for 10 years. He does a great job. Uh, so any holes that I left, go ahead and check out his video and he did a great job. Uh, there's another video, a couple other videos out there. Um, not my favorite, so I try to take my take on this scenario to how to catch alligator gar. Uh, this video is going to be way different than other videos because I break down location using Google Earth. I show you how to use um, modern sonars to find alligator gar. And I just kind of take a unique perspective on how to catch alligator gars in this video. So hopefully you stay tuned to watch this entirety of it. Um, I try to do my best job to break things down. If you have any questions or anything you want to discuss, um, I take some controversial takes on how to catch these fish, go ahead and drop those down in the comment below and I'll happily um, explain my rationale and why I chose or decided to go with what I did. So how this is actually going to go, I'm going to talk a little bit background on the ecology of these fish. Um, they're super interesting, unique individuals. Um, I'm going to break down location, as I said, on Google Earth, and I'm going to take you actually to the river to show you what that looks like on the river. Uh, the setup I use, uh, kind of baits that I'm using, um, and I'm going to explain in their ecology why I picked the bait that I did. And then lastly, fighting and handling these fish. Um, I am an advocate for keeping these fish alive to the best of my ability, so I'm going to show you some of the easiest ways to make sure that these fish are unharmed. So breaking down the ecology, they're long-lived fish. Um, people say they live up to 100 years. All the published reports that I saw, they live up to 50 years. Um, males don't live nearly as long as females. They live to be mid-20s up to 30. Uh, it takes about 10 years for them to get to their sexual maturity. So if you think about that, a fish has to live a very long time before they can reproduce. Um, other things like your sunfish should take two or three years to be sexually mature. So very important that we make sure that these long-lived fish um, stay in the environment. Uh, one fun fact about them is they're the fastest growing fish in their first year life being able to grow up to four pounds in that first year so you may grow fast right away but it definitely takes them a long time to actually get to their mature size a six foot alligator guard may take up to 20 years to get to that size some life history things spawning spawning is very important for all fish these are periodic spawners so they take advantage of one big um spawning opportunity every year. Um, this usually coincides with this big flood pulse late in the spring they um, spawn in floodplain habitats. So you get a flood forest or any floodplain. So you'll see a bunch of videos of people shooting alligator gar with bows. Usually they're doing this while they're spawning, which is terribly awful for these fish. Please don't um, hunt them with a bow. Uh, so in these backwaters, the females can produce over 100,000 eggs. So one good thing about alligator gar is if they do have an off year, so we don't get a big flood pulse in the spring, the year after they might have an opportunity to produce a bunch of eggs and maintain their populations. Uh, their diet, their opportunistic feeders. There's been studies on this for the past hundred years. Um, a lot of people complain that they eat sport fish like largemouth bass. So if they're in a lake that has prim prim primarily only sport fish, they're going to eat the sport fish because that's their only opportunity. But that's really not representative of what they actually eat. So in the rivers where they're native, uh, they're eating mostly rough fish, whether that's mullet, carp, or shad. Basically anything that swims by their face that's dumb enough to get close enough to their mouth, they'll probably grab it. Another interesting thing is their scavengers. So I'm going to use dead bait in my videos, and a lot of people use dead bait. So they don't be afraid they need some live bait swimming around. They will also go pick up something dead. Uh, I did catch a drum. Um, this winter that had an alligator gar bite in it. The drum was well over 20 inches long. I'm guessing it was like seven or eight pounds. So they definitely will go after these big meals, but definitely an opportunistic feeder. So don't swim too close to their mouth. Locations um, in the United States, um, that's where they're endemic to. So that's where they're from. Uh, and Texas has the largest um, natural populations of them. They're traditionally have been the Mississippi drainage. As you can see, they've been extirpated. So they've been gone extinct essentially from um, the middle of Texas and then up northern or further up in the Mississippi drainage. Uh, you can see that they're being stocked in areas around the country and their populations in general are trending up. So what we're actually interested in locations for fishing, I'm going to go ahead and hop on a Google Earth quick. If you don't use Google Earth um, for fishing yet, I would highly recommend it. It's a great way to kind of map out where you're gonna go. And I'm gonna kind of show you or walk you through my mindset and how I pick out these locations. 
So I grabbed the Trinity River. I personally do not fish the Trinity River, but it has all the key characteristics of things that I would look to for fishing for alligator gar. So I have all these spots picked out. Um, if you pick out this location, you fished it before, that's awesome. I hope I did a pretty good job picking it out. I'll uh, kind of pick apart things that I would usually look for in rivers. So when I'm looking at this aerial view of a river, I want to look for areas that have some sort of change in it. I don't want some long stretch that it's pretty straight, pretty narrow without anything interesting going on. So I want to pick areas that have these deep bends in it. So the reason about these deep um, bends, they, um, the bends in the rivers, they usually have some deep holes in them and it's like an opportunity for fish to kind of, kind of congregate and that there's big changes or something different. So I picked out this deep hole specifically in insert winter. So in the winter, all these fish will kind of congregate in these deeper spots, um, makes it pretty easy to find. I have a picture on side imaging that I'll show in a little bit of them stacked up in these deep holes. So in the winter that they'll kind of congregate in these areas in high concentrations. I personally haven't really targeted them in the winter yet, but that's a great way to find them. I'm more specifically trying to look for these runs that are adjacent to these changes. So I picked out this long stretch area that's adjacent to this um, like deep hole. So these fish will go congregate in the slower flowing water. It's usually pretty deep in these areas, like say anywhere from six to 15 feet, depending on which river you're on. But these long swaths of river, they're adjacent to something interesting. Coming down the stream a little bit, we have another potential long strike. We have this sharp 90 degree turn. Odds are it's probably pretty deep there as well. So I'd recommend picking this long straightaway between these two um, ends of the river because likely there's gonna fish that are gonna congregate. I have an example of an area where you probably wouldn't want to fish. So if you get down to these neck down areas where it's pretty narrow, um, you're going to have a lot of issues trying to catch these fish. Yes, there might be fish there, but uh, the neck down areas, um, you're going to have a lot of snags. It's going to be really hard to fight the fish. One thing that's really cool about alligator gar is when you get a big flood pulse, so you get a bunch of rain, all these the alligator guard, they don't want to be in the main stem of the rivers anymore because the currents move pretty high. So they'll tuck into these tributaries. So you get areas where there's like creeks running through. So they'll pop up in these creeks and other small um, areas like that. There's an oxbow lake that's connected to this tributary. So there's an even an opportunity for the fish to end up in this oxbow lake back here. Um, when they're in that oxbow lake, it's gonna be really cool because you're gonna be able to highly visible within these rivers. So Whatever river you pick, whether it's the Trinity River, Brazos River, Colorado River, any river here in Texas, I would definitely start by looking on Google Earth to find areas that have these unique turns in them, the long straightaways in them. Uh, and then more importantly, you can find access to these rivers. So on Google Earth, it's great to find access to the rivers because you can just scroll up and down the river and find um, where these fish are or possible ways to get on the river. So once you find that access point, then you can find areas that I just described here that are relatively close to them. All right, now we're gonna go live from the river. And welcome back to the river. Um, I'm sitting here on an undisclosed river. Um, I'm on the Brazos River. Uh, the video breakdown is on the Trinity River and that was very specific because the section I'm on this river is private. So, I, or at least the access portion of it's private. So I don't want to give away that spot. But looking on this river, uh, steep banks all around, uh, just long channel going this way, long channel going that way, steep banks on that side, a lot of woody debris. Um, there's going to be alligator gar spread all the way through this channel, wherever we're going to be on it. Uh, there's, so we're going to look for certain things on this section of river that might actually hold fish. Um, it is eight feet deep. There's actually one to my right, right here. You can kind of see where there's the thing separated. Take a quick screenshot of that. You can kind of see where these fish were and where that um, shadow is. So there's going to be fish randomly all throughout um, this river, but we're going to look down specifically where we can incre increase our opportunities to catch these fish. So I'm going to paddle down this river about half a mile and I'm going to show you my favorite spot to fish. And I made it to my spot. Um, so in that montage, you saw me stop and take a few screenshots. Um, uh, I'll show you what those look like as we're going through. I kind of marked some fish as we're going down, some things that were fish, some things that weren't fish, kind of um, show the scenarios to break down. So I'll break that down into the video right now. I talked a lot, or I'm going to talk a lot in this next video on like things I kind of look for on side imaging. If you are fortunate enough to have side image on your kayak, like I do, it's an awesome tool to find these fish. A lot of people have it on their boat, so it's a lot easier to find them if you're from a boat. A lot of these rivers are definitely big enough to get a boat in, so it's a great opportunity to um, use side imaging to find these fish to kind of get you oriented with what these rivers look like just in general. Um, I'm sitting in a deep stretch, relatively deep stretch in like eight feet of water. I'm looking on side imaging. You'll see a bunch of trees, 
Uh, there could be potential fish scatter out a bunch of shadows. Just there's a lot of complex structures that are going on, but for the most part, it's just this soft um, sand muck kind of bottom. So it makes it really easy to see these alligator gar when they, um, they, they stand out really nicely. So a great example is right before I stopped to talk about the, my favorite location, I was driving and I noticed that there's this weird looking mark over here. Um, it's kind of shaped like a log. However, it's not connected to the bottom at all. And this is what an alligator gar is going to look like. So zooming in on it, you can kind of see where you can see like a pectoral fin on it, it has a tail and it's definitely separated off the bottom. So this is for sure like what an alligator gar is going to look like when you're flowing down the river. So this would be a spot that I would stop and be like, hey, like well, I know there's for sure one here. I'll put a bait in front of it for a little bit and see if I can get that fish to bite. I mentioned in the Google Earth video that in the winter they kind of congregate. So in the winter, it looks a lot more like this. Um, where you can see that there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So there's a bunch of fish that will congregate in a small area. So it's definitely a great opportunity to access these fish in the winter when they're congregated. Um, one thing to note about fish in winter is they're less likely to feed. So as water temperatures warm up, metabolism increases, and as metabolism increases, fish have to feed more. So yes, there might be more fish congregated in an area in the winter, just maybe don't anticipate as many bites um, per fish because they're less likely to feed when the water is cooler. So on location. So that's what it looks like when you're driving around and you find some fish. However, not everyone has side imaging on their kayak and that's totally acceptable. Um, so there's other things you could do to kind of look for fish and kind of pick out your best spot. So when I first mentioned, I was just on that straight river stretch. It's just kind of all the same, some flooded trees on the side, uh, somewhat wide channel. Like I said, there's fish too there. I mean, I just showed some waypoints of that. But I specifically want to pick a spot that has something that's unique to the stretch of river that I'm on. Uh, so the, what's unique in this stretch of river that I'm on, as you can see all the way down on the end there, there's kind of like a curve where the river wraps around. So that's something that's uniquely different in the stretch of river that I'm on. Uh, down there, the current picks up. I'm currently going upstream with the wind from because the current's so low here. So I'm in a spot that has low current. These fish are lethargic, kind of lazy fish, very opportunistic feeders. So they're not gonna pick a spot that has a lot of current. So that area down at the end that has that current will probably deter fish from swimming down there. So this is kind of like a natural barrier lake that I'm kind of, or it's not really, it's not a lake. It's just a slower part in the river that these fish might congregate around. And I apologize if the wind, you can hear the wind at all, it kind of just picked up. So I picked this area that is adjacent to where that curves. I'll go down there and show you that in a second. But it's just kind of wide open area where there's potentially a lot of fish that just could be laying in here, buying their time. And up there, it kind of narrows down to where how it was originally, where it's not as wide, not as open. The water might be a little, a little bit, so there's less opportunities for these fish to congregate. Okay, so I picked this wide open area for two reasons. One, when you hook a fish, you don't want to have it run into a tree. So you've had this wide open area, it's a lot easier to fight these fish. You don't have to worry about them getting caught in snags. And two, I picked this wide open area because the fish, um, you have a lot more opportunity to get your lines in the water and be able to cover it. So if I sit here and I wait 10, 15 minutes, just look around watching, I will eventually see some fish pop up in porpoise. Um, these alligator gar obligate air breathers. So every once in a while they come to the surface to take a gulp of air. So the one nice thing about them, if you don't have side imaging, you can just patiently wait and you'll see these fish. So you just kind of sit in an area and you just wait. If you wait 10 minutes, you don't see any fish. Um, you know they're not here, so you can probably move on. But thankfully for me, right before I started this video, I saw one jump, so I knew that we were ready to um, take a video. So in this wide open area, where, I'm, where am I gonna put my lines? So I could put my lines next to this structure like this, which is probably not a good idea because fish will likely, or the fish might drag into the structure. And there's also a bunch of turtles and other things that might be annoying. So I usually try to pick areas that are more in the middle. So I might put four or five lines just right down this middle of this bend or this straightaway, potentially get some fish. Or you could probably stagger it where you put one like 15 yards out from the bank over here and you just kind of like make a zigzag all the way down the middle. I'm um, just kind of spread your lines out into this open area so you can increase your opportunities to catch fish. Another thing that I would highly recommend doing is if you see a fish porpoise or come up to the surface and take a couple air, go put a line by them. You can just paddle over, drop it where it is and you're good to go. Um, one of my best spots has actually been, so we have this structure that's kind of piled up over here. There's a little back eddy behind it. There's been, I've caught a couple fish out of there. So you can kind of like, as you watch these fish over time, you can kind of pick locations where they're coming up the most. And the areas where you see the most fish, you most likely get your most bites, so you're gonna put your lines there. 
All right, so we know where to go. However, we should probably figure out where not to go. All right, we are in a section right now that I would not fish. I just wanna show you an example of what that looks like. So as you can see, I am flying pretty fast down the current here. Uh, it's like three feet of water um, on the side imaging. There's nothing but a bunch of sand. Uh, this fast moving shallow water is really unlikely to hold fish. Back up quick. And the reason why is like, it's just a lot of effort for these fish to swim through here. Well, I would a fish that doesn't have to put that much effort into feed, just patiently waits for something to swim by its face. Why would it sit in this fast current having to work to keep up? When the food, like yes, this is a good conveyor belt for the food to be pushed through, it's just unlikely that there's gonna be a high quantities of food to make up for the effort of them sitting here. So definitely avoid these areas where you got this fast, shallow moving water. Um, you're just less likely to get bites, less likely to catch fish. One last look, just cruising down the shoreline. Might be pretty, just not fish here. All right, on to the gear portion of this video. So to start off with gear, um, in the state of Texas, alligator are considered non-game fish. So anything that is under the umbrella of non-game fish for illegal methods for taking them, you can go ahead and do so. Uh, so that's how I can get away with using jug lines like I'm doing today. So if you're unfamiliar with what a jug line is, congratulations, you're from the north and you don't have the opportunity to use them. But a jug line is any float vessel with the string of rope line, whatever it is attached and has a hook underneath it. You let that free float out in the river, lake, whatever you're on and whatever fish grabs it, you'll see your jug move. You walk over and grab it, reel it up. Pretty similar to tip up fishing, but the open water version of it. There are endless ways to make jugs. Um, this is the way I make them. Uh, if you have other ways to make them, congratulations. But this is how I do it, and this was, works really well for me for catching alligator gar. So to break it down, uh, I use a pool noodle. Uh, the reason for that is they're super inexpensive and they float really well, because that's what they're intended for. So I have this 10 inch section of pool noodle here. On the inside, I use PVC glue and a um, PVC pipe. Put that PVC glue on the PVC pipe, shove that PV piece of PVC in there, and it's good to go. Uh, you don't want to use super glue because super glue will melt the pool noodle itself, so you want to use that PVC glue. So we have the pool noodle and the PVC part that makes up the main body of this jug that I'm using. On this jug, I have a couple things attached. I have this eye bolt here. This eye bolt here is, as you can see, to attach the line to, to set your depth. Then I have this hole on the other side for to attach your main line to. So you have your noodle with your PVC, you have the eye bolt to attach your line to, then the hole to tie your line into. Uh, the cord I use on here is nothing special. Uh, you could use paracord, I use something a little bit thinner, um, it's cheaper and you can get more of it. So this is roughly like 200 pound um, breaking straight cord. Uh, to break down what's on the business end of this, beyond the cord, I have roughly like 20 feet of cord on all of my jugs just so I can vary the depth between zero feet and 20 feet depending on where I'm fishing. Um, the cord comes down to a three-way swivel. On this three-way swivel, I have a bank sinker, um, then I have this bobber above the bank sinker. So I use a two ounce bank sinker up to a six ounce bank sinker, um, depending on how fast the current is. I'm in a low current area, so I can get away with a smaller sinker. I have this bobber on here to hold my three-way swivel off the bottom. That way my line stays suspended roughly a foot to two feet, depending on what you want to do. Um, another thing to note, I have a thinner, easier breaking strain line on here. I have 50 pound braid just in case it does get snagged, the fish will be able to break this braid free and it's free to go. As far as the hook goes, I have these snaps on it. Um, the reason why I have my hooks on the snaps is just so it's interchangeable so I can switch between having this um, steel leader to a hook or I can have 200 pound monofilament or if I want to switch these out for actual catfish, I can put the 20 pound monofilament and a hook on there. So I have snap on there coming down to a circle hook. Um, you can use circle hooks or you can use small hooks. The jug I set, I have a smaller hook on. So the kind of hooks you use is all about preference. I like the small um, live bait hooks and these circle hooks because A, less likely to damage the fish. A lot of people use treble hooks for alligator guards, which I do not support. I recommend using these smaller hooks in case you do gut hook them and you can cut them off. Then in time, they'll um, rot away. Um, so I have these smaller hooks that I can use because when these fish bite, you're going to let them take it for a long time. So you just got these small hooks. Then I have the steel wire. Um, alligator guard have a lot of teeth. So I either use steel water, 200 pound monofilament. Both work. Um, the big fish that's in this video all throughout, uh, that was caught on 200 pound monofilament. And the smaller fish was go uh, caught on the steel wire. So bringing down my jug again, I have my noodle. 
I have a PVC pipe. I have an eye bolt to tie my line onto. I show you how to tie the line onto the eye bolt when I drop the line in the water. And it comes down to a three-way swivel where I have a lighter line um, that's tied to my bank sinker. I have the bobber on there to keep my three-way swivel off the bottom. Then I have this snap-on steel eater with the circle hook. Um, then I take these jugs, I spread them all throughout wherever I want to catch fish, and I break down where to put these jugs in my location video, and this is how you set these jugs. Okay, this is how I set my jug. Uh, I broke down the parts before, got the hook, uh, it's on the steel wire, got the little small um, live bait hook, got the sinker. I have my big sinker on this one, uh, it might be a, for your higher current area. So you get it all straightened out. Once you get it all straightened out, I like to drop it over the side right now. So you drop it before you have your bait on it. See how it stops spinning? It's on the bottom. I'll pick it up, take off about another foot of line. So I have like that foot of line slack there. You take this slack part of the line. I got my eye bolt on my jug. Take the slack part of the line, put it through the eye bolt, like that. And you take the line, wrap it around the outside of that eye bolt, cinch it tight. Cinch it tight in the eye bolt. Now that thing's locked in place. So it's just gonna sit with like a foot of slack on the line underneath the jug. That way when a fish grabs it, it has a little bit of a playroom, but your jug is gonna be mostly in contact with your line. So we got that set, come back up, take your hook. I always like to hook mullet by the lips. Um, the reason for that is that alligator guard can pick the thing up head first. Just put the hook through the lip like that so most of the hook is exposed. That way you get the best hook set into the fish. You just drop it down to the bottom Jug's catching up to it, and just like that, the thing is set, ready to go. You can just sit back, relax, and wait for a fish to come grab it. All right, now we have our jug set. We're gonna patiently wait for a jug to move down street. You'll notice that the jugs are just naturally flowing in the current, not a big deal at all. When a fish actually picks it up, it's gonna pull your jug downstream. So when alligator gar are feeding, when they pick up their bait, they're gonna swim down its current. Uh, it could be as little as 10 yards, it could be as much as 50 yards. Just watch your thing swim down. Usually it's like two or three minutes of them like actively eating it. Once that jug stops moving or starts to go back up current, this is when it's time to go ahead and catch that fish. And all right, so bait selection. All right, let's talk about what baits to use. So we have our jugs, um, can use as many as you want. I recommend keeping it pretty tame, only using like five or six max. If you're with a group of people, maybe get with a few more. You wanna keep them close enough to you though that like you can maintain them at all times, keep eyes on them. That way they don't get away from you and you can be on that fish as soon as it bites. So if you're getting lots of bites, use less jugs. If you're getting a few less bites, maybe you could use a couple more, but just be patient use less, um, maybe better for the fish when you actually hook them. So we might actually putting on this. Um, in this video today, I'm using mullet. I have like five inch mullet and I have heads of bigger ones. Uh, alligator gar eat very large things. Um, that's where their diet's composed of, um, comprised of. They're eating large baits. So I usually try to pick something that also matches the same size and profile of what they're using. I'm using mullet because they're really easy to get. I can go down to the coast with a cast net and get a couple hundred of them in an hour. Uh, so it's really readily accessible for me. Other people um, will use things like carp, buffalo, other insert rough fish here, and then you just cut them up and use large portions of it. So what I'm trying to get at is it's really all not that it's not all that specific on what you're using for bait. Just get some large smelly profile that's roughly um, gonna be a meal that's worth them to eat, but not too big that's gonna take them all to eat it. So a hundred pound alligator gar could eat a five pound buffalo, but you don't want to use a bait that that's big because it's gonna take a long time for them to get their hook in their mouth. So that's why I use these smaller chunks of bait that have the opportunity for the fish to get that lure or get the bait in their mouth relatively quickly in a spot that's easier to get a hook set instead of using that larger profile bait. I do want to note that using heads is more productive than using tails. However, I use both just because I don't want to be wasteful with the bait that I'm using. And yeah, for your bait, it really does not matter. I mean, it does matter. Just get something oily, something smelly, something that's readily accessible to you. Um, I like the mullet because they're easy to get. Um, gizzard shad are also pretty easy to get. Um, if you like carp fishing, 
double duty awesome just get something that you can for sure have a lot of access to and it's really easy for you to get bait and get it out there all right fighting and handling um i showed you guys how to set up everything how to find the fish how to get a jug out how to get your bait in the right spot what happens when a fish actually bites though um i mentioned in my jug setup video the when the fish picks it up, they'll move it downstream. However, how do you know when or like what to do when you actually get those bites? So in this next couple of videos, I'm going to like verbally walk through what I'm doing in real time to kind of like show you how I'm catching these fish. So I noticed that my jug was moving. Uh, first thing I do anytime I see my jug moves, I try to get to it as fast as I can. Um, it's going to float downstream for a little bit. Once it stops or once it's been like two or three minutes, like max, at that point, I'm going to go up to the jug and I'm going to try to get to the fish. So in this first video here, as you can see, I'm creeping up to it. This is not going to be a very big fish, so I'm not going to do anything special with it. I'm just going to hand line it how you normally would hand line a fish with a jug. So I grabbed it, set the hook as fast as I could. Fish is going to come up to the surface. It's going to thrash. Um, since you are hand lining a fish, it's going to take off. You got to feed it line a little bit. And this is just going to go back and forth a few times. If you've ever tip up fish before, tip up fish before it's identical to that. So you're just going to hand line this fish up until it gets tired. It's going to give a few good runs. Um, I'm going to mostly control this fish because this fish isn't very big. So when these smaller fish, you want to tire them out as fast as you can. So this fish is pretty tuckered out. It's going to give a couple more runs. But once this fish is now like pretty tuckered out, you can go ahead, drag the fish to shore. You can net it, do whatever you need to do to kind of get these fish in. But just get to shore as fast as you can so you can get the hook out of it. We're about to transition to another video right now. So this is gonna be what you do when a bigger fish. So these bigger fish, um, they're the top of the food chain. So they're not as response to feeling pressure as other things. Uh, I screwed up here and buried my transducer into the jug. Would not recommend doing that. Definitely <laughs> put it on the side where it's away from your transducer. So once I get this fish free, I'm gonna go ahead and set that hook right away. Setting hook. So with this big fish, it's not acting at all until it hits the surface. So it hits the surface, it takes off. Once it takes off is when I switch over to having a rod. So it's right next to me. So I can go ahead and pick it up right away. Fish is on there. Or if it gets further enough away from me, I'm going to make a cast or two to get on it. I'll just cast the line where your line is, and you can go ahead and fight that fish. At this point, when you're fighting the fish, it's just going to be like two or three minutes of you fighting this fish back and forth. You got a big fish on, they're going to give you some big runs and other things like that. Um, with these jugs, that line um, on the jug itself is designed so you can grab it and hold on to it. So if you think you're at any point, you're going to lose pressure on that fish, just go ahead and grab that line and maintain it. It's going to take another big run, but you're on your rod anyways. So you just kind of hold on to your rod um, to fight that fish once it makes that next run. And like you did with the smaller one, once you're done hand lining it, you can get it closer. Once he tires out a little bit, you can start heading towards shore. So once you get to shore, um, this is where what I'm doing is very different than most people. So a lot of people will use a rope to lasso alligator gar so they can control them, they can handle them. However, like I said in my um, introduction, um, when you put that rope on that fish, um, it's really going to tucker it out. You have risk of damaging the gills. Um, you can damage fins. Um, there's probably good data out there that says it's probably okay. Um, I'm personally not okay with it just in case like anything goes wrong and that rope gets stuck on the fish. Whereas like I have this line on my jug that I can manage with my hand. It can like fish aren't going to break it because it has a really high breaking strain. So I can go ahead and handle these fish by just using the hook itself. So I'm up to shore. I'm going to grab the line pull it up to shore. Um, notice with this fish that I'm keeping it really close to the shore. And the reason for that is just in case it flops away. And this big fish here, it'll beach itself when you're using the rope. So like it's the fish are managed very well. Um, make sure you have your players nearby. Um, I have one sitting right in the front of my kayak so I can walk up to it. I can't see the hook here. I'm using a really small live bait hook um, and I have monofilament line. So I don't know where the hook is. I can't see it. It's very small. So it's really unlikely to damage the fish. If you're using a big treble hook or a giant circle hook, like you're going to cause a lot of damage. That's why I use the smaller hooks that I said in my um, your video. Because you know, like I can't see this hook, even if it was only 30 seconds or two minutes or however long it's for me to get to the jug. Oh, no. 
but I was able to clip that line right away. Um, in this smaller gar here, um, I grab my pliers. I have big two pairs of pliers in my kayak at all times. This is a smaller pair. I also have a bigger pair just in case it's a bigger fish. But with this circle hook, I'm able to pop it out right away. Um, they have really bony mouths, so it takes a lot of effort to get the hooks out. But for sure, to make sure your release gears are right next to the fish. Circle hook, you just turn it back and it should pop right out. And since this is a smaller fish, I'm not going to go ahead and take a picture with it. Um, I'd recommend if it's not your personal best or if the fish isn't insanely special to you to just go ahead and release it right away. So like I'm going to put this fish's head back in the water. It's just going to take off right away. I turn him out and he's going to take off poof. So the benefits of not handling these fish is they take off right away. And if you do want to pick one up, um, I'm going to pause the video, to kind of show you what it looks like, kind of break it down. So I have my front forearm wrapped underneath it, um, right behind the gills where the rope would normally be. My forearm is gonna put a lot less strain on this fish than say a rope would. I'm keeping the fish within a foot of the water. If you're keeping a fish close to the water, if it does flop or anything and I just drop it, it's in water that I can just swim away and so I'm not gonna cause any unnecessary damage to the fish. And this is like, the fish is so big that you need to hold it out or anything. So just like make sure you have a really strong grip on these fish. And then if anything does go wrong, they're in a situation where they're just going to take off in some way. Unfortunately, I do have an example of bad handling of a fish. Um, this alligator gar that I caught in Galveston. Um, I, when I went to pick it up, it flopped and I just didn't have a very good grip on it. But I was close enough to the water that the fish was able to swim away unharmed. And just like that big one, my friend Keith tried to pick it up and he couldn't and dropped it and the fish just swam away just fine. An alternative method instead of beaching them is you can net them. I would only recommend netting them if it's um, a small fish. So you're gonna watch me fight a little guy here. Um, with the rod method, I just walked up or got up to it, snagged the rope, fish is on, I'm fighting it. Um, I'm going to go ahead and paddle forward a little bit here to get the line tight. Um, when you do grab them with a rod like this, you don't have very much line to fight them. So if I create distance between me and the fish, it allows the line to be more aligned so you can manage these fish a little better. Give me a couple of good runs. And like I said before, with this line that I have on my jugs, you have the ability to grab it and you're not going to hurt yourself. I just wouldn't wrap it around your hands at all. Just have it away or can slip through your fingers. It's just going to come say hi and take off. So at this point, the fish seems pretty tuckered out. So I'm able to grab a net. And once the fish is in the net like it is here, I'm just going to leave the fish in the water. I can reach down with my pliers, unhook it, everything's safe, it's breathing, it's doing just fine. Uh, leaving the fish in the water as much as possible, I think, is key for these fish. They can breathe air, but that doesn't mean we can be reckless with them. Uh, they're a great resource, but since they are such long-lived fish, we do have to make sure that we can ensure that these fish are going to be healthy. So leave that fish in the water and it should be just fine. Take it out of the net and you pull it up, take a picture with it, get it right back in the water and it's good to go. So that is going to conclude my video here. I hope you learned something. If I said something you don't agree with, great, throw it in the comments below and we can talk about it. Uh, definitely take care of these fish with them being so long lived. We gotta make sure that these resource um, stays um, in shape. And the best way to do that is to minimize time handling these fish, get, keep them in the water as much as possible and make sure that you're using small hooks. So you're not damaging the fish. Uh, my jug method probably gonna be controversial. A lot of people prefer to use rods and fight them that way. Uh, it's legal in Texas. So I'm going to do it until I say I can't. I'm using the same hook, same method, same timing as everyone else's. Just don't get reckless with what you're doing. Make sure you're always keeping your eyes on those jugs. 
Uh, these fish definitely give away where they live. I know I really broke down location on the Google Earth and everything like that, but if you're ever concerned about if you're in the right spot or not, just look around, you'll find these fish. And most importantly, once you find these fish, go have fun. Uh, this is a great thing to share with people. Um, my roommate and I, Keith, caught that big one together. It's a lot of fun to share these moments with other people. So get a couple of people out in a couple of kayaks, get a boat out, whatever it is, just share this with other people and have fun, enjoy it. Uh, thank you for watching this video. Um, if you have any questions, definitely drop them down below. Um, if you don't like anything I said, again, drop them down below. If you have any questions, I really appreciate all the feedback I can get. And thank you for watching.